Good afternoon, colleagues, and a really warm welcome. Today feels really special for me for a number of reasons. When I first joined, which feels like a lifetime ago, um, and I mean that positively, everything was virtual, everything was online. And, and one of the people that I got to meet very early on was Sarah. And I was so struck by the commitment, the passion, the power of the work that was being undertaken by SEI. And so today, for me, today is special for a number of reasons. It's a real privilege and a pleasure for me to be here. We, are, we get asked to do a lot of these, but this one was something that I wanted to be at and be part of. And let me tell you why. Because today isn't simply about a celebration. Today is about an acknowledgement about the incredible work and the achievements of the Institute. But it's also about the impact, the outcomes, the power of the stories and the cases that you are gonna hear. And for me, when I read the case studies, it was, well, what, when we talk about partnerships and we talk about the new strategy, and I'm gonna say something about that, today's an exemplar. So a celebration is an acknowledgement, but it's the heart of what partnerships means that we will see in action today. The work that you'll hear about and that I've been so lucky and privileged to read and also to hear the narratives of the work that goes on is because it has a global reach. Its importance is about making a measurable difference but it makes a measurable difference where it matters most. We only have to look around us in terms of what's happening in the world to be able to say, what are those big global challenges that we should be working on? And what's special about this Institute is that it goes beyond asking those difficult and complex questions. It works with its, with its partners, not to do to them, but to work with them. So why is that so important today? And why is that important for me? And why is that important for every one of us in this room? Because partnership working for me is at the heart of any university. Um, a number of you, Charlie says I've got to stop saying this, but I'm not gonna stop saying this. I have no desire to be a pro-vice chancellor. I do have a desire though, to make partnerships and engagement a part of every university's business. Because that's a big responsibility. Without those partnerships, without putting that research to work, without engaging with the very people that you are gonna be here for, what's the purpose of a university? So partnerships for me, at the heart of any university, and more importantly, they're at the heart of our new strategy. The strategy makes a compelling case to ensure that a university for public good delivers on our values in terms of local commitment on a global scale. But what do those empty words actually mean in practice? And so for me, part of the new strategy is that partnerships have to be critical by design, just in the way that you will see SEI as an institute doing. They do their work because it's critical by design. And partnerships have to have, they have to harness our convening power to connect, to engage, to disrupt and be disrupted. So whenever, when anybody says they want um, stability, my argument is our work can't be done. We also have to have purpose. And that means building on the York way through our shared purpose, through activism, and not one that only captures the intellectual agenda, but engages with hearts and mind. And again, the case studies you're gonna hear are about that. And the third has to be about principles. Our pioneering spirit in pursuit of new challenges for contemporary times and contemporary communities. So our partnerships of the future, as you will see from the case studies presented today are about accessibility. A picture paints a thousand words and the images on those case studies say so much. 
It's about how we interpret, it's how we see the world, and it's how we move on and how we tackle some of our assumptions. And so in summing up, it's about a symbol of activism. It's a representation of action, de deliberately designed to be different, seeing things differently and making a measurable difference. And I'm absolutely delighted and proud to be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd now like to uh, invite uh, Monty Nilsson, SCI's Executive Director, uh, to also introduce um, SCI's approach to partnerships and also perhaps say a few words about the new uh, partnership with the university here. Mons. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, pleasure and honor to be here with you today to celebrate this partnership, which has now in its 33rd year, actually. Uh, but this is my first visit here in quite a while, as you can understand. Uh, and also last week uh, in Stockholm, we were able to assemble our global leadership at SEI with our center directors from Estonia to in Colombia, Kenya, Thailand, here in the UK and US. And uh, we had a chance to meet in person for the first time in three years to discuss strategy and operations, where we need to invest and move forward in the future our strengths and legacies to build on, but also if we need to adapt to a changing landscape. Um, SCI's goal is to produce excellent science that can be taken up and used for better agenda setting, better decision making and capacity building. And this science base sets us uh, apart a bit from most of our peers and competition in the institute and think tank space. Uh, it is sort of our special source, really, um, together with this regional presence that gives us an ability to be ground truth in our research and our policy advice. And the world of policymaking sometimes recognize this and see it. Sometimes they do not, as you know. But those that want to base their decision making on sound science for sustainability, they tend to know us. Uh, many of the uh, other institutes say they want to do excellent science, uh, but they really cannot start doing that very easily. Um, why is that? Well, one ingredient, of course, is this university connection that we are nurturing. It is a legacy strength uh, to have university partnership like the one we have here today. Um, and it, in, in SCI's mission is to bridge science and policy. In that mission itself, you can hear the, the idea of partnership and the impetus for partnership. And of course, those kinds of partnerships where you bridge science and policy is more with those that take up and use our research, whether in government, international organizations, NGOs, or businesses that are working to transition. But that skill and predisposition that we have to be on the bridge also shapes our research and the way we do it. We almost never do a project on our own. So we bridge between policy analysis and basic research, and mostly we do that to the universities. For me, this is an important thing that I think is paying off for SEI and for society, and we should keep investing in it. And arguably the, most, the deepest and strongest of our university partnerships is the one we have with the University of York through the, our common child, SEI York. Uh, now, I first came to York in 1995, actually visiting SEI, then in the biology department. At that time, everything was just a gentleman's agreement. There was no papers, no rules, but, and it sort of worked, but when things got rockier, um, which they did, uh, around the, in the early 2000s, not because we didn't coexist well or had big problems in, in our relationship, but because of individual cases. And it became unclear how to deal with things and it was challenging at times. So 
during my predecessor, Johan Schillenstjärna, who together with Brian Fulton created and crafted a new and more formalized approach to our partnership, which included both a written agreement and a board for this for SEI York. Uh, and today we had our uh, annual spring board meeting this morning. And last year we renewed and further strengthened this agreement, uh, hopefully for many years to come. Um, and we try to work like this in all our centers to have a close connection to the university. Um, for example, in Sweden, we work very closely with Stockholm University, but it's not in the same deep way as here. And uh, SCI York is arguably uh, the strongest form where we actually are co-owning the sort of the, the institution. So in summary, I guess what I want to say is that uh, we want to stay in York. Uh, the 33 years so far has not always been easy but we have been on a really positive trend, I will say over the last 10 years. And after successfully transitioning to the new SEI York leadership with the brilliant Sarah West uh, and the new agreement. And indeed there's also a new university leadership in place. I think we are seeing a really bright future for SEI York. Thank you very much. And I need say no more to introduce the brilliant Sarah West, Centre Director at SCI York. Sarah, please. Well, well there's an introduction, isn't there? Right. Um, I am delighted to see you here in three dimensions after two long years and to be joined by many more people online. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to very briefly talk about some of the reasons why I'm extremely proud to be SCI York Centre Director. So SCI York is in a unique position in the University of York. We have unrivaled connections to partners all around the world by our, other, our seven other centres. And these partners range from the very local, for example, community arts organisations in Nairobi, to the international, for example, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and the World Economic Forum. Collaborating with these partners allows us to make meaningful change on the ground. And you'll hear that through our case study shortly. We are also a unique position in SEI in that we're the only centre to be fully based in a university, allowing us to collaborate closely with researchers from all disciplines, including those in the Department of Environment and Geography. SEI research is all action oriented. Our staff are problem solvers and capacity builders. This means that we and those we collaborate else with in the university are having real world impact from our research. Our work at SEI York is, in, is organized into five research areas, air pollution and climate change, critical environmental governance, sustainable consumption and production, environmental health and well-being, and citizen science. All our groups aim to achieve three kinds of outcome. The first is changing agendas, which is where our research leads to new policy agendas, such as the methane pledge launched at COP26, or changes in attitudes. The second is enhancing capacities in our partners to use tools, analyze data, and include different voices in activities, including co-designing new technologies to support development. The third is improving decisions, where our research supports decision-making processes, for example, in sourcing products through supply chains or working closely with countries to increase their climate change ambitions. We want people to take action as a result of our work. And we believe that working in close partnership is most likely to facilitate action being taken. Our work is done exclusively with partners, whether they are the general public taking part in citizen science activities or policymakers helping shape research product projects. We currently have around 100 projects on the go. And next you'll hear a flavour of who we work with and how. And you can find out more about some of our other projects in our poster session afterwards, which I hope you will stay for. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sarah. Um, I'm also extremely proud when I received notice of the four case studies that were going to be presented and discussed today, just the, the, the partnerships that have been developed, but also the amazing impact that these guys have been having. Um, so you're gonna hear now from four different case studies, um, and they're gonna to talk to you about the partnerships, um, the challenges, 
the opportunities, how they maintained momentum, how it added value be to work in partnership and the, the, what the outcomes were. So we're gonna start off by hearing from Simon Croft, who uh, is on my right, your left, if you're in the audience here, um, Simon and Lawrence um, as well, who are going to talk to us about commodity footprints. Over to you, please. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so going first means that I have the pleasure of giving you the best case study talk you've heard so far. So that's an honor that I'm pleased to have. And the fact I'm wearing a shirt and tie shows how seriously I take the privilege of being here. Um, the collaboration that you're going to hear about and the revolves around work to do with measuring and monitoring impacts of our consumption, especially in, with an eye to overseas impacts, often far away from the point of consumption. Um, these are linked by often long and complex supply chains and disentangling the systems and linkages that join these things up is far from trivial task, which I have to say, because it's what I'm paid to do, um, but it's also actually true. Um, the work and collaboration between SEI and JCC can actually be paced, um, traced back about 10 years. And indeed, I joined SEI about a decade ago now um, on a project funded by DEFRA, looking at the UK's overseas impacts. Um, that I'm here today, 10 years later, still talking about the same work suggests a certain level of commitment, dedication and tenacity from myself and members of the team, or possibly that we need to get out a bit more. But either way, a group of us here have now been working and focusing on this area for some time now. And with that, apparently, we've become something of experts in our fields. Um, we have methods and frameworks like the IOTA model um, developed in York and the Trace platform led out of Stockholm. And with these, we're developing key technical capabilities and pushing the envelopes with novel approaches. And then across projects like the GCRF UK Trade Hub and previously the University of York led I Know Food Project, we've been developing contextual understanding and applications as well as multidisciplinary networks. So during this period of time that I've been working here, there's been at the very least a kind of simmering level of dialogue and engagement between SEI and JNCC. And um, following the initial DEFRA project that I was actually brought in to work on, there's been a number of projects that we worked directly on. But over the years, it's been quite challenging at times, not least with changing government priorities, budgets, and personnel. Governments. Um, this has often resulted in a change in landscape, and not least importantly, when it comes to budgets. But SEI's ability to diversify its funding sources meant that this work didn't sit still and stagnate. And indeed, we've carried on developing this work and building on it for the the 10 years that I've been here. And then more recently with the UK government's 25 environmental plan, the stage was once again set for us to kind of bring this back to the fore of the UK's kind of focus. And the collaboration between SEI and JNCC has really solidified and taken it off again in the last sort of two or three years. Um, this has seen a, a marrying of joint long-term visions and ambitions along with complementary skill sets and expertise. Um, this started with discussing some options and looking at kind of available methodologies and what was out there, reviewing certain things. And then recently, um, the tail end of last year, culminating in the development um, in, in a project led by JNCC and then developmentally led by us at SEI with the launch of a new experimental statistic for the UK government. Um, a mutual respect has, I think, been a key component of the working relationship between the two of us. And a great example of this has been the sort of trust and confidence that JNCC have placed in us to take forward the methodological developments, but also the design and implementation of an interactive dashboard that came along with this work. It was sort of discussed early on in the project and we kind of took it over. And whilst the work was actually carried out under sort of auspices of this UK indicator for the UK government looking at UK impact, I think it was really great that JNCC um, sort of saw the scope and value of what we'd actually done and what we were sitting on and the potential and the capacity and the kind of models and methods we have. And so instead of this dashboard just being like a simple set of graphs associated with this UK focused um, interest, we actually have this fully interactive dashboard now that's online. Um, this has got 160 commodities, 200 countries, um, I think 12 metrics. And that's now been picked up and used by different governments, NGOs, academics across the world. Um, so it's really sort of extended beyond the initial kind of notion of it just being this kind of UK centric, fairly narrow scoped view. Um, and so, yeah, not only is the kind of statistic we developed a world first for kind of developing a developed country, but also the underlying methods and data are now freely available and open to everyone. 
Um, before I hand over to Lawrence, who hopefully doesn't disagree too strongly with anything I've just said, um, SEI's tagline is um, about bridging science and policy. And I think for me, that's often felt like a sort of aspiration rather than reality. And what's been really nice for me in this work, and that's um, in no small part at all by the collaboration with JNCC, is that it's really felt that actually that's become a reality. And this isn't just work that's on my laptop or behind closed doors, it's out there, it's making an impact. And as I say, the collaboration with JNCC has been key to making that happen. Thank you, Simon. Um, so uh, I'm Lawrence Way, I'm from the JNCC, and I very much welcome this opportunity to uh, pay back uh, Chris for coming and talking to our committee uh, um, about the work. Um, and it's very nice to hear, be here at your celebration event. So JNCC, if you don't know us, um, we are a, an advisor, technical advisor to the governments of the UK. So in the Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and Westminster. And our purpose is to help them restore nature. Um, and consumption is the biggest driver of biodiversity loss globally. Um, the footprint uh, of the UK's consumption, both with, on its own land, a very high intensive own land use and uh, overseas is very large. But it's been enormously difficult to keep this in the policy agenda and link it to land use balance changes within the UK and outside and so on. And as um, uh, Simon mentioned, 25 year plan gave us a new opportunity. Uh, but we really wanted to make a long term uh, evidence base that would keep the issue fresh. Um, and we, we needed critical mass of expertise. SEI had the track uh, record and expertise in this area. And I'd like to say that we're good at making things stick. So that was the partnership. Um, uh, Sam's already mentioned that if, if each of us had been asked to do this on our own, you'd have ended up with a web page with a graph on it. Um, together, you've got an interactive tool which is relevant to multiple countries, multiple commodities, and uh, also multiple impact types. Uh, so the real environmental issue of consumption is very well illustrated. And, and, and I don't know, those of you that are in the field, getting people to think beyond carbon is very hard. This does a lot more than that. Um, in terms of impact, so by producing something where we both had a long-term agenda, We've got something that is not only an official statistic, um, we've got something that's being proposed by the UK for the uh, uh, monitoring framework for the new uh, framework of targets uh, under the Convention on Biodiversity uh, in the consumption area and also the mainstreaming area. Um, it's been used to a degree in some of the due diligence thinking uh, that's now part of uh, uh, government policy, particularly prioritization of commodities. Uh, it is a way of doing some of the analysis behind free trade agreements, um, and it's really also helped, um, particularly Scotland and Wales, think about their uh, environmental strategies. So doing something about the scale of footprint is devolved, uh, and Wales, under its Future Generations Act, has uh, a commitment to reduce footprint, but it really would like to also reflect that in terms of impact. Um, so we've had a lot of use already. Um, so, ICI can answer why they picked JNCC. Why did we pick SEI? Well, it's a, a combination of things. You, you're really looking for somebody with an agenda who's going in a direction in an important area, is thinking through the problems. Um, SEI have a very different stakeholder mix to us. We're very public sector, delivery bodies. We work on the inside. Um, uh, and our funding sources work that way. So, but there are, uh, uh, so the stakeholder mix is being different people in and they bring in different sources of funding, which is how you keep things going through time. And uh, I've got down here due diligence winner. So um, we parasitized a big look at uh, tools in this area done under the trade hub. Um, and I was very easily able to convince my organization that this mixture of MRIO and um, uh, uh, physical trade flow was really the, the global winner. Uh, so uh, it's been absolutely brilliant working with the team here. So what next? Well, you know, we're not going to rest on our laurels. Uh, I think the key challenges are really connecting scales now. So uh, the overseas footprint is very well connected to the land use challenge 
within the UK. We desperately want to do more things with land than we have. And, and so you stand a massive choice of, chance of outsourcing your environmental problems if you solve your environmental problems here. So we want to make that scale link. Um, Simon's mentioned really trying to provide something a bit more compelling for people managing individual supply chains. And there's more to go. Uh, we don't have a full commodity scope and some of the impact indicators have been improved. So the to-do list is quite long, but you need a long-term partnership for that. And we work with SEI. Thank you very much. Simon and Lawrence, thank you very much for that, for, for that presentation. Um, a couple of quick things. Uh, please don't forget to use the Q&A to start registering questions, type in those questions, but she'd like to know what the challenges were that Lawrence and Simon came across as they were trying to develop this amazing interactive dashboard. Um, and also uh, something for the speakers, please do let us know when you want to hear, have the next slide presented by just saying next slide, please. And now I'm very happy to introduce um, Alison Dyke and Jonathan Dent, who are going to talk to us about urban treescapes. Hi, thank you very much for all coming today to hear about some of the projects that we do. Um, I want to tell you a bit about a project called Branching Out. Um, and Jonathan Dent from uh, St. Nick's, who we're in partnership with, isn't able to make it today. So we've got a little video from him talking about the, the partnership from their perspective. And then I'll, I'll tell you a bit about um, the partnership from, from our perspective. So Branching Out, it's a, a project which is funded under the UKRI Future of UK Treescapes programme um, with colleagues here in SEI, also the departments of Computer Science, Archaeology and TFTI and uh, the University of Loughborough and Open University and finally Forest Research. So it's, it's quite a large project of 2.5 million over three years and we're just coming towards the end of our first year now. So the project focuses on governance of urban trees, and in particular, the inclusion of social and cultural values in decision-making. We're working in three focal cities, York, Milton Keynes, and Cardiff. And our partnership with St. Nick's relates to our work here in York. So the project does three main things. The first thing is that we're developing a framework for analyzing and working with social and cultural values. The second thing is that we're developing a better understanding of those values and how they apply to the characteristics of the treescape. And to do that, we're working with storytelling and narrative to bring out the values that local communities hold around trees. And then the third thing is that we're mapping those values, the social and cultural values of trees, using a citizen science approach. So we're working with an existing platform called Treezilla, which was developed by the Open University, and we're extending that platform to map social and cultural values in, in a new way. So those three things contribute to tools and methods for including social and cultural values in decision making. So you may ask why that's important. So I have a little example for you from here in York. So could I have the next slide, please? So this tree that, that you can see here is a tree which is in the center of York. It's a tree which is known as the magical tree of light. Um, it's situated between the castle museum and the courts on an area of green space. And just recently, it um, became the, the focus of some public attention because the area where it sits was being proposed for redevelopment and there were several different options which came up as to how this space could be used in a different way. And some of those options involved cutting down this tree. And one of the reasons given was that it blocked the view of the, the buildings around. But when the public consultation opened, there was quite a public outcry about the loss of the potential loss of this tree. And the reasons for that public outcry were around social and cultural value that it has. When I said it was a named tree, it's called the Magical Tree of Light. And the reason for that is that it's um, hosted part of the York Festival of Light in recent years as a lighting installation. It's also um, been part of the stage setting for the, the York Mystery Play. So those kind of cultural history and um, natural history uh, reasons are why people were upset about the potential for it to be lost. 
And what ended up happening was that a redevelopment option was chosen, which didn't involve losing this tree. So the point that we want to come to with branching out is that those kind of situations don't arise, that there is an understanding of social and cultural values of trees before they get to a point where they might be lost, or so that strategic decisions can be made about the treescape of a city, which will maximize social and cultural benefits. So in the branching out project, we take a co-development approach throughout. And our local partners are really important for us to understand the decision-making context that they are operating in and the constraints and opportunities that are there for them. So at SEI, we've worked with St. Nick's, who are a local civil society organization for a long time. Certainly that relationship predates my involvement with SEI. We've worked with them on citizen science, so projects that we've developed ourselves at SEI, and also helping them to deliver their own citizen science projects. In the Branching Out project, they have kind of multiple different capacities. They're working with us as an end user of our work, um, and helping us to co-develop some of those aspects. They're helping us to convene citizen panels and using their convening power that they hold as a, a really well-connected civil society organization to do that. And also to actually map the trees that we have in York. So I want to go now to a video from Jonathan Dent to let him speak from their perspective about our partnership. Hello, my name is Jonathan Dent, Natural Habitats Manager at St. Nick's. St Nick's is an environmental organisation and charity um, based in York, just outside of the city walls. Uh, we do a range of projects all focused around sustainability, from nature conservation to ecotherapy, waste minimisation and green energy. Uh, we've been involved with the Stockholm Environment Institute for a number of years, um, initially around lots of citizen science work and projects and helping um, and Stockholm Environment Institute have been key in helping us develop what we do in terms of citizen science, mainly with an ecology focus, um, with the work that I do. Um, and that's kind of focused more recently into developing a grassland quality survey pack, um, which measures the quality of the wildlife habitat um, of grasslands, which we're now using across the city on a range of sites. Um, more recently and currently, we are working with uh, Stockholm Environment Institute on the Branching Out project, um, and we've been involved in the end user panels. Um, for us, I think the benefits of this project is um, just having those kind of key stakeholders and decision makers in one room. Um, and talking about something and having those discussions that perhaps people wouldn't generally have the time to, to have them. Um, I think going forward, I think the kind of value of thinking about trees in a more diverse way um, is really important as well. And that ties in really well with all the kind of projects that we do at St. Nick's, which often have a kind of key community focus and thinking not just about the nature benefits, but about the benefits for the community um, as well. Um, longer term, going forward into the future, um, I think the, having the kind of citizen science evidence base um, across the city will be kind of vital for the work that we're doing and progressing. Um, with our Green Corridors project we currently have, we're working across the city and beyond as well. So having that extra information that we can use to monitor and measure change is going to be really valuable. Um, and looking at funding bids for new projects as well, um, having those kind of social in indicators as well. Um, so, yeah, so thank you to Stockholm Environment Institute for helping St. Nick's develop as an organisation um, and good luck going forward. So, from our perspective, partnerships with civil society organisations like St. Nick's are really important for developing co developed research that has a real impact at a local level. In cities, Trees are expected to deliver multiple policy objectives around carbon sequestration, health and well-being, green jobs, you name it, trees are supposed to do it. But on the other hand, they also compete with developments, roads and services, things like new broadband cables, for instance. So local authorities who are supposed to square all of those competing needs 
have had significant funding cuts in recent years. And that makes it really difficult for them to, to deal with this. And while they might have funding available for new tree planting schemes, there's very little available for maintaining or replacing existing trees. Indeed, City of York Council don't actually collect any sort of data on trees apart from health and safety checks. So when they say to us, the sort of citizen science data that you're talking about on social and cultural value would be really useful in decision making, but we don't have the capacity to, to collect that data. That's where civil society organizations like St. Nick's really come in. They're able to think beyond those immediate funding constraints in a way that's really difficult for local authorities. And that makes them an important partner when we're asking decision makers to think differently beyond their usual mode of operation. Citizen, um, sorry, um, St. Nick's as an organization and as a venue is buzzing with volunteers mental health support groups, people who are ready and willing to deliver citizen science. So in the future, we'd like to continue to work really closely with St. Nick's. They're a really fantastic forward thinking organization and they make their community a better place to live. So our relationship with them is part of SEI's relationship with the city of York and as a part of the University for the Public Good. I hope we can return and hear, hear from, from Jonathan. Um, but now we can pass over, uh, hand over to Eleni uh, Michalopoulou uh, and Roderick Weller, um, who are going to talk to us about air pollution and a partnership on air pollution in the private sector. Eleni. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored and very happy to be here today. And this is my first physical event in over two years. So a bit of nervousness. Um, right, so actually coming here today, I thought that I had a very complicated story to say, because that story includes a lot of dates, a lot of partners, a lot of meetings, you know, Zoom meetings, Teams meetings. But then it just occurred to me that it is actually a very simple story, because it is a story about a fellowship. And like with any other fellowship that embarks on a quest, whether you want to slay a dragon or whether you want to improve air quality, what happens is, and apparently that's just the thing that, that happens, is that the members may start as dispersed, you know, many countries, many companies, many places, but then they just gravitate towards each other in a very, very magical way. And this is what happened in 2020. Um, so uh, if we can have the next slide, please. Thank you. So if you, if you will, just imagine these three, maybe squares, as, as the members of this fellowship, because this is what was happening in 2020, and these three things were happening at the same time. The, the UN was, uh, had established the first International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies. This was a decision that was made in 2019. And in 2020, we were working towards um, building that first day, the first celebration. But at the same time, the World Economic Forum was putting together the Global Future Council on, on Clean Air, which is one of their think tanks. This is, these councils are part of how the World Economic Forum uh, works and develops. And we were also in discussions with IKEA and the CCEC that you heard from Sara before, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, about developing a guide that was going to focus on quantifying air pollutant emissions from the private sector. So this is what was happening in, in 2020. The members of the fellowship were coming closer and closer together. Um, I was very, very fortunate to start to work with the World Economic Forum. Um, Rodi, myself, and members of our group were participating in the celebrations of the International Day of Clean Air and Blue Skies. And that third part of the slide, the, the guide is now uh, what I think Rodi will be focusing on. Thank you very much. So I will just, like to give uh, Rodi the opportunity to have um, the word now because I think he's supposed to be talking on this slide. And just one thing to say before we go to Rodi, because today is about our partnerships and the stories behind them, I think it's just very important to share that the, the driver behind this partnership on the specific project between SCI and the World Economic Forum has been a very strong shared vision to improve air quality. And I think that one of the things that have been pulling us closer and closer together and, and working on so many different things 
is the fact that we approach that vision with a lot of honesty, a lot of ambition, but also a lot of realism. So hopefully now Rod is going to talk about how our fellowship is expanding. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Eleni. Um, and I didn't realize I was the only live guest. Next time I'd love to join you in person. Um, so yes, my name is Roddy and I'm the project lead for, for Clean Air at the World Economic Forum. Um, I've been at the forum for almost uh, seven years now. And as Eleni mentioned, we started focusing on, on the air quality piece right before the International Day for Clean Air. So when we first opened this, um, this position and I transferred into it, uh, we started speaking with the CCAC to see where the forum fits in, in the space, um, being relatively new to it. And the CCAC suggested that we look at the private sector um, because the forum has over 900, or around 900 um, business partnerships. So we're really well positioned to, to mobilize them and they're largely missing from the picture. And as Lenny mentioned, as part of that, um, SEI were on the scientific group for the day. So uh, the CCAC suggested we connect with the SDI to, uh, to, start, to start to discuss the ways that the private sector can tackle air pollution. And following a couple of conversations um, and Eleni joining one of our workshops, uh, we created that GFC um, and we invited Eleni because she's immensely knowledgeable on the topic and um, also very passionate. So Eleni actually has become my first point of call for anything air quality related and anything related to in life in general now. Um, and we speak um, every week, uh, basically to keep up the momentum of, of this partnership. So once we launched, launched the GFC, they helped us, which is, our, which is the mini think tank that Eleni was um, referring to. Um, the GFC helped us to start to scope out uh, what is the business case for doing this, um, including the economic impact, um, the impact on employees, the impact on communities. And they also helped us out, um, in the outreach effort in their own communities um, to see which private sector, um, which of the private sector might be interested in, in joining the alliance. So over the next few months, we secured um, enough commitment to launch at COP26. Uh, with these, uh, if you go back to the one previous slide, uh, with those 10, those 10 founding members. And these 10 founding members are all committed to measuring their efficient footprints and creating actionable plans um, on, uh, to reduce them. And there's also a focus around how businesses can champion um, the importance of clean air with their stakeholders and, and also to um, use their innovation capabilities to find new clean air solutions. So the, in terms of challenges and opportunities, there hasn't been any challenges with the, with the partnership with SCI. So I, I hope you mean the challenges around um, the private sector. Um, and that's really that it's a low priority. And um, until this point, there's been very few businesses who have looked at the air pollution emissions and companies are just simply not coming together yet. Um, so that was one of the challenges, but the opportunity is that strategies that focus on, on health in the short term can be a novel and, and a underutilized lever to motivate um, personal and community and corporate action, and also to help gain public trust, which is something that has been flagged by um, a number of uh, partners in this alliance and elsewhere in the forum. And also like climate action, all industries have a role to play, which means that the alliance can be scalable. And anyone who's made net zero commitments or climate uh, commitments, but wants to go further could could be part of this, um, this effort. Um, so to keep up momentum, uh, we have, as I mentioned, a weekly meeting with the SCI team and the Secretariat team. Uh, we also have a couple monthly meetings with the Alliance members, the, the ones on the screen. And uh, that way we help keep up, um, keep up the conversation, keep, the, keep them um, focused on, on the deliverables that we want to see within the year. Um, one of those meetings is led by SCI on how to use and apply the guide. The other meeting is focused around innovation and champion, which the forum run, and we're looking at uh, working with some media partners as well to um, around that piece. Um, and we also set and as a last um, way of keeping up momentum, we have a senior advisors group meeting where we tap into more of the leadership team within the organizations. That way we can hear about their strategies and priorities and find ways to link into them. And also that they help ensure that the Alliance objectives are progressing um, throughout the year. And also they share those updates in other community leadership communities where they're engaged to sort of start to spread out the, um, the, the, the message outside of the air quality bubble. Um, in terms of how the partnership has added value for, for um, both SEI and, and the forum, um, for the SEI piece, I believe that the forum brings the private sector engagement piece um, and they can tap into that network and use it to advance the agenda, uh, which Eleni mentioned. They had already started building the air pollution emission guide 
beyond the forum. That was a conversation that was happening um, with the CCAC and IKEA, and it just dovetailed perfectly with the work that we were doing. Um, and also, SEI can leverage the forum's um, media channels and digital channels um, to amplify the messaging that they um, that they that they have. And the, as an example, the forum has about thirty million followers, so it's a really it's a really good network where we can um, share the great work that SEI is doing. Um, for the forum, the benefit is that we get the thought leadership and subject matter expertise um, to the alliance on a critical piece that's um, you know essential to our objectives. And um, they and and SEI are helping those members work through the guide on on something that hasn't hasn't existed until this point. So um, yeah, but there's a lot of benefits for both sides. Um, in terms of the outcomes, we're still very much uh, in the early stages of this journey. We only launched the Alliance for Clean Air at COP26 in November 2021. 20, uh, so um, it is early and the, all these members are, are very much committed to moving from, from the objectives and the commitments towards action. Um, to give you a sense of what we hope in 2022 is that these 10 members have tested the guide that SEI are creating and uh, that way it's fit for purpose and uh, it's also you know ready publicly um, for when it uh, launches around late summer. Um, the, the absolute um, ideal would be that all our 10 members have an air pollution footprint and, and, um, a, uh, and, a, and a plan on how they're gonna reduce those emissions uh, by COP27, although that's, that's very ambitious knowing, um, you know, it's, it's not something that applying the guide can't happen super quickly, but I think they're all ambitious companies. So we'll, we'll hopefully get there. In terms of the, the championing piece, we want all the members to start champion action um, with their employees and their customers and communities. And also we want to identify business leaders who can, who can um, explain why they're part of the alliance, why it's important with their networks and with peers. And around the innovation piece, we want to start to highlight global examples of um, innovation from the air quality field. And we also want the members to start to work together um, to find synergies and find ways to, to collaboratively um, take action. Um, which is something that, as I mentioned, just hasn't happened before. And those last two pillars are a bit broader on purpose um, so that we find those, those interaction and design points, whereas the, the measure and reduce one is very specific per company, but there will be learnings. And um, Eleni has been presenting in our, our meetings. I think what we've found is that there's a lot of, they're finding a lot of benefit from, from sharing uh, how to overcome missing data, how, they, how to um, apply different emission factors uh, to their existing greenhouse gas models. So there's a lot of there's a lot of benefit from, from doing this all as a, as a group. And just to finish on the key next step for us, uh, SEI and uh, the forum have been discussing creating an MOU um, to, to more formalize this relationship. Um, the guide that I mentioned um, is being uh, road tested by these members and it will be publicly available from uh, around quarter three to quarter four. The, we want to continue to grow the alliance um, but ensuring that we grow it in a way that it's with the leading and progressive businesses and that we're proving the impact that we're having along the way. So we'll aim for another 10 members by COP27. And uh, lastly, we're discussing funding SCI directly um, around the uh, around the second phase of the guide that's focused, focused around mitigation scenarios that can be applied um, across the value chain and integrated with existing um, or planned greenhouse gas um, mitigation strategies. So those are our key next steps. Thank you very much. Yes, I think we, we need to wrap up now. So I'll just thank everyone for, for listening and thank you, Rodi, for joining. Um, and that's it from us. Thank you. Now, I'm reliably informed that if we all cross our fingers, then we may well be able to hear from Jonathan Dent. So over to you in the AV booth. Roll the footage, please. Oh no, we still can't hear anything. No good? Okay. I am going to go straight over to Steve in that case. And uh, 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 welcome Steve uh, and Carly, who are going to talk to us about inclusive transport, improving mobility choices for vulnerable groups. Please. Thank you, Robin. There's a huge element of danger because I've got a video in my talk as well. <laughs> so... Uh... <laughs> Good to see so many of you here. And as Rob said, I'm gonna be talking along with one of our key partners, Carly Gilbert-Patrick, 
about inclusion in transport planning. So if we go to the next slide, So this is a typical street in Nairobi, and you can see the pedestrians there doing their daily commute. So around 50% of the population in Nairobi walk or cycle to make their way to work or education. And if you're in Kampala, it's even higher, about 60%. So for many European North American cities, this would be something to aspire to. Having active travel like this is something we're trying to instigate, things we're putting in infrastructure, and encouragement to make more people or encourage more people to walk or cycle in their daily commutes. But in Nairobi and Kampala, it's, it's very much typical. It's what everybody or most people do, particularly what have been termed vulnerable groups. So they include the poorest members of society, but also young children and the elderly women and children. So these are the typical types of people that are moving around cities, walking and cycling in, in these countries. But unfortunately, as you can see slightly in the picture, the, the infrastructure that they're provided with is not really conducive to this uh, mobility. Uh, they're given very poor infrastructure choices, and it means they have lots of interactions with tra traffic and, and motorised transport. And that's partly related to the sort of emphasis that's been put on infrastructure and, and who to uh, invest in, what modes of transport to invest in. So walking and cycling is, is sort of seen as a, a lesser choice hence the lack of infrastructure. But unfortunately, that interaction with motorised transport and pedestrians is leading to huge numbers of road fatalities every year. So just to put that in perspective, in 2014 in Nairobi, there were 723 road accident fatalities and 70% of those were amongst pedestrians. So a huge number of people being killed every year. The latest statistics I showed or seen showed that that's even increasing and it's actually higher than the death rates from COVID that we've seen. So it's a huge challenge uh, and that's the thing that we became involved in in SCI when we started to look at how could we better include these vulnerable groups in decision making around transport and road planning in these types of cities. So the way we made movement on that uh, and started to generate a partnership was through some funding we got from the Global Challenge Research Fund, which was to build a network. And I worked in partnership with colleagues in York, uh, and we developed an, uh, a workshop where we were going to look at how we could improve these vulnerable groups using more creative methods in decision making. And to identify the people to attend the workshop, one of the key people that we were recommended to work with was UNEP Share the Road programme. And my colleague Howard and Gary, who's in the audience up there, had previously worked on a previous project with Carly Koinanga, as she was then, Carly Gilbert Patrick now from UNEP Share the Road. So when we held the workshop, we also did a stakeholder mapping activity, and we saw who was related or knew each knew each other and who went, they went to for trusted information. And UNEP Share the Road and Carly in particular came out as the central node in this network. Everybody in the workshop either knew Carly, knew somebody who knew Carly and received information from Carly. She was the sort of hub of this, this sort of information and this work that we were getting involved in. So she was a critical part of our partnership building. And hopefully now I'd like to hand over to Carly, but this is where the... Hello, my name is Carly Gilbert Patrick, and I'm based at UNEP, responsible for our programme on active mobility, digitalization of transport and mode integration, sitting within our wider UNEP transport unit. Our role at the transport unit is to support governments and other stakeholders all around the world to decouple increased mobility from increased emissions. We believe that we can have economic and transport growth, but that does not have to be detrimental to our planet. We work on national and city policy, stakeholder engagement, capacity building, advocacy, research and data, and we cannot do it without our partnerships. Stockholm Environment Institute are one of our trusted partners. They're doing novel policy and practice research grounded in evidence, which is really important for us in the areas of road safety, inclusion of vulnerable groups and climate resilient mobility, very complementary to our portfolio of technical support areas at UNEP. This collaboration has given SEI access to a wide range of stakeholders, but also introduced us at UNEP to new ways of working. 
So for example, SCI introduced us to new creative methods for inclusion in transport. The partnership between us has delivered project funding and developed an expanded knowledge base on climate resilient issues in Africa. We've also developed a guidance framework on how to use creative engagement methods, which will be hosted on the UNEP Share the Road website giving longevity to SEI for their work and also building our UNEP catalogue of tools and guidance, really sort of showing how this partnership has added value for all of us. I think what's also critical is not just building our partnership, but getting the most value for money for our donors by maintaining those partnerships too. And we have worked with SEI on a number of projects together and will continue to do so. There's the iSmith project, which has tested and evaluated the impact of implementing creative methods in Kampala and Nairobi. We've developed a toolkit of methods. And as the UNEP Share the Road programme, we've acted as a key partner for that project. There's also the British Academy Equitable Mobility Project, investigating health and wellbeing impacts of journeys in Nairobi and Mombasa for vulnerable groups. Again, UNEP acted as an advisor. Then there's also the FCDO High Volume Transport Inclusive Climate Resilient Transport in Africa project, testing creative methods to improve inclusion of vulnerable groups, developing a guidance framework for African transport planners to inform decision making, and as UNEP, we sit on the steering committee. As the next steps to sort of show how we're continuing our partnership, UNEP is organising a policymaker workshop in Kigali, Rwanda in June, and SCI are one of our key partners. They'll be attending and participating in the forum and delivering training and capacity building on tools that we've co-created through some of the projects that I mentioned. We also have a really new exciting project starting with UK PACT FCDO funding, working with key transport beneficiaries, women and marginalised groups to accelerate decarbonisation of Indonesia's transport sector. This is a three-year 2.5 million project starting in 2022, and it's a partnership of SEI, UNEP, and local Indo Indonesian partners. We look forward to continuing our partnership with SEI. Thank you. So just to show some of the outcomes of this partnership, so actually what can be achieved through partnership working, so on the top left there, you can see, uh, at the very top left, you can see that street that the person was walking on in the initial picture. So that's Latuli Avenue in downtown Nairobi. And through the partnership between SCI, the city authorities and UNEP Share the Road, we actually managed to transform the infrastructure to put in better paving, uh, cycle routes, and de demotorize that street to make it much safer and also improve the air quality for people working and living in that area. On the bottom left there, you can see Kampala and again, Namarembi Avenue, which is one of the key hubs for getting in and out of the city centre. And again, this is pre our involvement with the city authority. And then you can see the infrastructure improvements again that occurred, including more cycling infrastructure and better pe pedestrian infrastructure. And this was really critical in the COVID crisis to enable Ugandan people to get in and out of the city centre more safely than relying on motorised minibus taxis. Finally, uh, the last two pictures are from Lusaka, where we've been working most recently, again, using creative methods to improve road safety. And you can see 3D zebra crossings that we developed as part of our project that have since been invested in by local uh, insurance agencies around schools to improve road safety for school children, reducing the speed of motorised transport and improving safety. So final slide, please. So just finally, I'd like to thank the team of people that I work with across uh, York and other SCI centres, the partners we work with in those cities, including some other universities and the funders that have enabled us to make those outcomes and impacts. So thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much, Steve and, and Carly for that. We're now uh, moving into uh, Q&A. Um, and I hope that some of you have been able to log on, post some questions online. If you haven't been able to do that or would like to do the traditional route, uh, we also have a couple of roving mics. So you are able to raise your hand and we will make sure that your question is addressed. Uh, but I'm actually going to ask Francis, who has been monitoring the Q&A chat 
just kick us off with a question. So Francis, over to you. So um, this is a question for Alison first. Um, and you talked about um, the different social and cultural value, values that we place on our treescapes. And the project branching out is working in a number of different case study areas. I wondered if you could reflect a bit on how SCI and how the project um, possibly adapts its co-design approach, depending on the geography of the case study um, and how we, yeah, how we tailor our approach essentially based on geography. And I'd also like to extend that question to Steve as well. Well, um, the three different, the three cities that we're working with in the UK are surprisingly different. They have quite different development trajectories and different landscapes of stakeholders in each city. So in Milton Keynes, there's a, a trust that manages all of their parks and open spaces, whereas in our other two cities, they're managed mainly by, by councils. So we have adapted our co-development approach slightly to take advantage, well, Yes, I suppose it is to take advantage of those different landscapes of stakeholders. Um, as I was saying when I was talking earlier, there are different constraints associated with different kinds of stakeholders. And actually, I, I suppose if we had time, had time to think about this much in advance, we would have realised the kind of constraints that local authorities are working under at the moment. But we've actually had to work a lot more with civil society organisations because of the kinds of funding constraints that local authorities are operating under at the moment. Um, the, I suppose the other, other thing that we're taking into account in our case study cities is um, the, the demographics of the population as well. So in addition to the end user panels, which Jonathan was talking about being involved in, which are the decision-making stakeholders, we also have um, a citizen panel, which is made up of a, as representative as possible sample of the population of the city. So we're really aware of the different ethnicities that are present in each of our cities and the different kind of cultural histories which we've got um, which we need to represent in, in each of the cities in, in order that we are um, catering to the, the, the different needs that they might have and the, kind, the different kinds of values that might be present in, in different kinds of demographics. I hope that answers the question to a certain extent. Am I on? Yes. <laughs> Scarily echoey. Um, yeah, so in terms of the geography, and I think the co-creation activity that Alison started talking about is kind of critical to how we've been working in different cities. So we often engage with city stakeholders, ranging from city authorities to communities, to ask them about the specific locations or challenges they're experiencing, and also where opportunities for change might be. So working with city authorities on locations where they think they could invest or change infrastructure, which helps to deliver some of those outcomes I showed. So identifying places where there's, there's a potential for change and then at the community level, actually working with those vulnerable groups, a good example is most recently been actually mapping people's journeys around uh, Nairobi and Mombasa from two low income neighborhoods to identify the kinds of journeys they're making, where they're going, and also where they find particular hazards and challenges so that we can very, uh, with high granularity, if you like, identify the key problem areas for them so that when we're making those investments in infrastructure, they can be on sites where there's going to make a real difference to people's journeys and their safety. So, yeah, that geography aspect is kind of critical to a lot of what we do, and hopefully that addresses the question. Thanks very much, um, Steve. I've got another question actually from the Q&A um, and it, it really relates to the current geopolitical turbulence uh, that we can see, the, the fact that we're also in a, in a recovery from COVID. In what sort of, and I'm, I'm thinking perhaps Mons might like to, to, to give us a bit of an answer to this, so I'm going to have to invite you Mons to come up and, 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 and address this. What, what sort of role might partnerships play given this level of turbulence and volatility? Is there a special role for partnerships in helping to shape agendas and address these, um, the, the decisions that are, are needed at the moment? 
Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I see that, well, from, from what I see, the partnerships uh, that we are uh, in and nurturing are becoming more and more important. And I don't know if it's because of the turbulent times or if it's because of the increased competition or if it's because the problems are getting more and more difficult. But I can see that our, the people that do we want and the organizations that are taking up the knowledge that we can provide, they are uh, more open and attentive and interested when we come together as a voice. It can be uh, even the funders that we like to um, um, entertain to, to say, uh, if we come alone, we are probably having some good ideas that deserve funding, but what about um, sort of the uptake and where will this go? And when we come together, it could be with the local, uh, it could be with the city council, it could be with the university, it could be ideally both. When you see those con con configurations, I think it's maybe it's evidence of a, uh, a level of performance that uh, gives confidence to our audiences. So um, uh, ever more important now that we are have been in the COVID lockdown situations and online meetings. Without our partnerships, we would have had a uh, incredibly difficult time doing our work. Now, thanks to our partnerships and our distribution, we could uh, continue effective work and engagement all over the world. Um, so it's also a kind of a, a uh, attribute, a resilience attribute in a way. Sarah, do you want to, to add anything to that from your perspective um, at York? Um, I think, yeah, I think, I think having partnerships, as Mon said, allows us to have more credibility. It allows us to um, be speaking with one voice. Um, I think partnership working can also be challenging. I know when, so when the Ukraine situation kicked off, Mon said, have we got any Russian connections? Have we got any Ukrainian connections? We need to look at what's going on here. I've, I've myself had project, big project delays as EPSRC aren't signing off on the project because we have a, we had a Russian based partner. And um, so it can cause challenges as well, the partnership working. Um, so I think, but I think those kind of partnerships that we have here in SEI, you know, I've been in SEI for many, many years now, but people always said to me, SEI is seen as a trusted partner. We're an honest knowledge broker. And that honesty, I think, is really, really important. Um, and I think our partners really value that. In us, um, and we've got partners here, so maybe they'd like to say something about that. But I think that people do really value that honesty and those trusts. And then we can have those difficult conversations with them and say, okay, well, this is what's going on in the world at the moment. How are we all gonna navigate this together? And I think that, that, honest, that honest role that we play is, is really important. Kieran. I think for, for me, you've both raised two really important points. You know, one is this notion of trust. Trust doesn't happen. And just, you know, hearing the power of the, you know, those case studies. And so we've got to kind of lose this perception that, you know, um, we build a partner and suddenly, you know, we have trusting relationships. Trusting relationships build, you know, take time. They need nurturing. Um, and it isn't about what am I going to get from it at the end of it? It's, it's almost like an experiment, isn't it? And so I think that's really important to kind of highlight. Um, but I was also struck about the question of COVID. I think what COVID has, has taught us, and if a positive was to come out of it, it's given us the ability to extend our reach. So what, what it's happened is, you know, I love that notion of science and policy um, and practice working together, but they're not new things. You know, partnerships and universities and policymakers and community groups and civil society have worked with each other for many, many, many years. But I think what, what it's heightened is 
our capacity to extend our reach and the power of what happens when we actually listen. And that's an area that we don't often talk about in partnerships, about the capacity to listen and to hear and not to talk at people. And I was really struck again in the context of the case studies and the work that's done. Um, and then how do we put that intelligence to work? And so I think, you know, COVID has given us the opportunity to, to change our perception and partners' perceptions about the value that each can bring. But that's because we've had to listen. It's much harder to listen when you're on um, Zoom and you have to pay attention than it is being in a room when you can be distracted by 101 kind of other things. So I think for me, you know, trust, engagement, and, and authentic engagement are absolutely key. And again, all of that was highlighted. That's what brings about change. That's what influences policy. Because actually policymakers have been saying for years, um, we need you and want you to work together. And what we haven't actually done is thought about, well, what does working together actually mean? Thank you very much. I think Francis has got another question for us. So Francis, speak to us. Thank you, Rob. Building on that last question, um, I'd like to ask a question to Lawrence, please. So this is, um, we'd like to understand more about how you have formed and maintained partnerships and how, over, how you overcame challenges. Okay. Um, so Jane says he's got a bit of skin in the game at partnerships. So we have one that's 33 years old, for example. Um, and they are based on they're sort of several layers. Uh, and just I think that all of these apply to the way we work with SEI. So first of all, you, you've got to have two or more bodies that can see a problem that really needs to be fixed and want a long term solution to it. So it's got to be a common agenda. The organizations have got to be well matched. So if GNCC tried to partner with PricewaterhouseCooper, I don't think they'd listen to us. And they're a very good company, of course, obviously, but, you know, we're small. So, um, you know, your partners have got to be people who are looking for an alliance to get their message across. Um, I think you also need to have different perspectives and different skills. Uh, that, that really is critical because then the sum is greater than the parts. And then finally, the trust thing. Um, so trust is personal and it's also institutional. So um, institutions will trust each other if they're not going to get rooked, if they're not going to be dominated by others, those kinds of things. So that's important. And trust at an institution level can be very important. Um, but trust is also important at the level of the people doing the work, and that also builds through time. And you can tell it works well when it survives uh, individuals. Uh, and um, I can say that in this case, because uh, this area of work was started by uh, a colleague of mine who's now retired, Tony Whale, and James is still, is still working with SEI. So I think those are several of the things I can think of in terms of how do you sustain a partnership and what makes it work. Thanks very much, Lawrence. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question of uh, Eleni and Roddy. Um, sometimes in the world of research and academia, there's a certain reticence about getting too close to, to business, um, and perhaps even having a, a financial relationship with them. I'm just wondering whether you've thought about you know, you want to bring about change, your agenda, your vision is about making sure that through value chains, air pollution is accounted for, acted on, and the co-benefits are seized. How do you make sure that you're doing that in a way that disrupts the way that they do business, but at the same time allows them to buy into something that is quite disruptive, potentially quite disruptive to their way of doing business, making money? Um, Rodi, I can just go first and you can perhaps come in as well. I think that, I think maybe that is, there's a bit of a misconception there because I think that 
I'm, I'm not in, um, uh, I'm not with the CI very long. I've only been here for two years, but I did my PhD with the private sector as well. So with the aluminum and the semiconductor industries. And, and one thing we were always talking about was how can they change things quicker than it would be expected from them to make the change when the policymakers would step in. So actually they wanted actively to be one step ahead of that. Uh, but it was very important to them, and now I'm getting flashbacks from my PhD, which is not a great thing, but it was very important for them to talk to people that understood their context. It was very important for them to talk to researchers that could understand what it means to disrupt your operations for an amount of time, uh, what it means to have to change the way you produce things, what that means for their supply chain, what it means in, in, you know, in terms of time and delays and, and costs. And once we've had these discussions, and that's again for my PhD, the, it was just amazing to see the change take place. Um, I mean, with that work, we ended up putting together a, a chapter for the 2019 IPCC guidelines, so the refinement to the guidelines. And for this work, and I think Rodi can, can confirm this, with a discussion we've been having with the companies, they are so keen to change, but they just sometimes need help to really pinpoint the opportunity or really see how this fits in with what they were already planning on doing. So Rodi, perhaps you would like to elaborate on that. I think you answered it very well. Um, what we're doing is really linking into existing discussions that we're hearing from the, the leadership of these, um, of these companies who we're inviting to be part of the, the Alliance. Um, so for example, we have a community called the um, CEO Climate Leaders, and that's 120 CEOs um, who convene about three times a year at forum events, um, in person, um, normally, or um, more recently, virtually. They, they, they say, they, expo they spoke, talk about the, the challenges they're facing, one of which is the public health element, and taking action that um, is visible in a short period of time is one way to overcome that. So I think this, this lends really well towards that and shows that they, they are, taking those progressive steps. Um, so it links into a lot of the um, existing conversations and strategies that they're, they're already taking. Thank you very much, Rodi. Just, just one more sentence. I think that once we started having those discussions from the point of view of an existing opportunity or even a missed opportunity, for those companies, for example, that were already looking into greenhouse gas reductions and the benefit of that uh, on air quality. So once we were we introduced that type of phrasing and that sort of dialogue, I mean, with Rodi, we have just been engaging and engaging and listening, as was very well explained before. Thank you. Thanks, Eleni, and thanks, uh, Roddy. That was that was really interesting. Um, it's really time for us to begin to wrap up um, our session here now, um, because after this we have a, a, a networking uh, event um, for those of you here in person, um, and there'll be tea and the opportunity to interact with um, SEI researchers. There's a poster uh, session as well. Um, so I don't want to delay the opportunity uh, for that. Uh, networking, um, but I'm going to just say a few a few closing remarks, things that I've picked up in, in this uh, conversation. And really, I, I think there are four things, four characteristics that I'm hearing uh, to do with partnerships that are both around the, the partnership at an institutional level um, uh, that SEI and the University of York has, uh, but also in these case studies. And, and the first is credibility. We've heard that word many times about credibility of understanding um, maybe what the question is that needs to be addressed, making sure that it's, you're working out what the benefits are, making sure that the audience, the users that you're working with also can, can really see what's in it for them. The second is scale. Um, and that's about making sure that you're acting at the right scale, but also that you can scale up solutions, that you can go from a partnership to something that is actually changing agendas or uh, pinpointing decisions that need to be uh, changed. It's also perhaps about scaling out to new users, um, 10 more hopefully in uh, LNE's project together with the World Economic Forum by the end of this year. Uh, third quality is persistence, being sticky. 
uh, both sticking together in the partnership through certainly through thin, thick and thin and, and trust is a key element of that but also the ability through persistence to actually keep on going perhaps uh, when pro policy priorities change or uh, financial uh, uh, situations uh, are different and the, the last one is about insight about bringing together two different perspectives and actually making sure that we do make the whole greater uh, than the sum of its parts. Thank you very much everybody who has joined today's celebration event. Um, I found it really inspiring to hear these case studies and, and look forward to coming back again to SCI, coming back again to the university um, and hearing more about the fantastic work that's being done here. Uh, I must of course thank some people who've made all of this possible. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to all of our panellists, and I'd like you to uh, give them a round of applause, please. Um, and uh, obviously, thank you in the audience here and online uh, for your questions, engagement and your interest uh, in our work. And a special thanks to our organising team, uh, Lucy, Victoria, Francis and John. Uh, thank you. It was brilliant organisation and the way you've managed to handle some of our technical challenges was very professional. So thank you very much. Now, enjoy the networking session, which is just downstairs, um, and you can hear more about all of our exciting research. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.